The following is a reflection on the readings for Monday of the fourth week of Ordinary Time. The first reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 to 40. The responsorial is Psalm 31, and the Gospel is Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. Our first reading from the book of Hebrews is truly a remarkable account of various Old Testament saints from different backgrounds who experienced great victories, men and women, young and old, rich and poor, they all persevered in the midst of the most trying of circumstances. Yet what is even more remarkable, they did not receive God's total reward yet because they died before Christ's incarnation. Their sufferings were endured, their perseverance maintained on faith and the promise of the Messiah to come. But God had planned something even better for them and us. These Old Testament saints prepared the way they left us examples of courage, fortitude, and humility. Now that they are in heaven, in that face-to-face -face vision of Christ, they continue to prepare the way. That is because in God's marvelous plan, He providentially established the great mystical body of Christ that transcends space and time and includes the church on earth, the church suffering in purgatory, and the church triumphant in heaven. That body will only be complete when all the saints from the Old Testament and New Testament and this church age are brought together. The ultimate reward for all of us is that perfect union with the Blessed Trinity in heaven. So we are called to join the struggle, we who belong to the church on earth. God provides the means because the mystical body is linked in so many ways. We can pray and offer sacrifices for our brothers and sisters in this life who are still on the journey. We can pray for those who have died and are undergoing purification, and we can implore the saints in heaven to pray for us. The most effective way of achieving all this is through the sacraments of the Church and in particular joining in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The Mass on earth is really a participation in the heavenly liturgy that is going on eternally. We know this from the book of Revelation and what the Catechism tells us. The church on earth and in heaven are united in the single offering of all our sacrifices in union with Christ to the Father in the love of the Holy Spirit. Of course, at every Mass we pray for the deceased, those in purgatory, and invoke the saints in heaven especially the Blessed Virgin Mary. What tremendous solidarity we have with each other in Christ. May we join our brothers and sisters in prayer, and especially the great heroes of faith mentioned in our first reading from the book of Hebrews, to bring about the great reward God promised, one glorified body of Christ in heaven. When we turn to our Gospel from Mark chapter 5, the good news continues as Jesus makes his first incursion into Gentile territory to confront the powers of darkness. Like his first appearance at the synagogue in Capernaum, Jesus wastes no time in performing an exorcism. It is his first miracle in each territory, indicating that the kingdom of God is here. The strong man who had bound humanity for millennia prior to the Incarnation is now conquered and his possessions are being plundered. Although the demons tried to prevent Jesus from landing by whipping up a storm on the sea, Jesus rebuked the wind, a term of exorcism. The violent forces of nature having been quelled, Jesus will now quiet the storm raging in the poor man who is captured. Notice how the demons attack the man's dignity. Naked he howls day and night, breaks the chains that tried to bind him, and mutilates himself with stones. When Jesus asks his name, the reply is, We are legion, a legion being 6,000 soldiers in the Roman army. This man is therefore terribly infested with demons. Knowing Jesus' identity and their imminent defeat, they beg to be sent not out of the territory, for they have it dominated, but into a herd of pigs. Jesus consents because he knows what will happen. The pigs, not wanting the unclean demons, hurl themselves down a steep bank and drown. 
we are meant to recall Pharaoh and his army, enemies of Israel, drowned by the Red Sea in the first exodus. Jesus, the new Moses, is leading humanity in a new exodus out of sin to the promised land of heaven. The formerly beleaguered man is now fully restored, evidenced by three statements. One, he is clothed, a sign of dignity. Second, he is sitting, a sign of peace and rest from his former frenzied state. And third, he is in his right mind, that part of the person most in the image and likeness of God. This is such good news, yet we notice how the townspeople and swineherds react. The people are suddenly afraid, and keepers of the pigs indignant over their economic loss. Mark shows here the radical nature of Jesus' call and how it demands a response. Perhaps the people got used to the howling of the demoniac and figured as long as he is excluded from our community, we can accept his condition. Jesus' power and authority, however, must evoke commitment one way or another. For now, this is too much, and they insist that Jesus and his disciples leave the territory. When the healed man begs to go with Jesus as a disciple, the response is, No, stay with your family and tell everyone how much the Lord has done for you. The messianic secret imposed by Jesus in Israel would have no application among the Gentiles. Here we see the new evangelization. Although Jesus leaves, the man cannot help but tell his pagan family and community of the encounter. In the next chapter of Mark's Gospel, we see the results. Jesus returns to the territory, and this time the people welcome him with open arms and bring forth all their sick for healing. This is what the great heroes of faith in the letter to the Hebrews had longed to see, freedom from sin and the devil conquered through the glorious deliverance of the Messiah. Now we are called to join their number and continue proclaiming this good news. To the extent that we do, the last verse in today's first reading is being fulfilled. Quote, Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. End of quote. We are each in a sense the demoniac in that sin has defaced us. Our world today is desperately in need of the good news of Jesus Christ's deliverance. Mark's Gospel account reminds us of the power of personal testimony of just one converted sinner. Since it takes courage to tell our story, let us call upon the saints and martyrs in heaven who endure persecution to help us grow in faith. As our psalmist today proclaims, quote, Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was beset as a city under siege. I said in my alarm, I am driven far from your sight, but you heard my supplications when I cried out to you for help. How abundant is your goodness that you have laid up for those who fear you and accomplished for those who take refuge in you in the sight of everyone. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful. End of quote. Let us pray. O God, who in the abasement of your Son have raised up a fallen world, fill your faithful with holy joy, for on those you have rescued from slavery to sin you bestow eternal gladness. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God for ever and ever. Amen.